Hello everyone, this is Eye on Africa for Monday, November 29th. Here are the headlines. South Africa's government says it's being punished as it tries to get countries to walk back some of their travel restrictions. Dozens of nations have put severe limits on people arriving from several southern African sta states. A big day for LGBT residents in Botswana. An attempt to overturn the decriminalization of homosexuality has failed in court. And the China-Africa summit has kicked off in Dakar this Monday. Participants are discussing trade as well as the pandemic. In a first big announcement, the Chinese president has pledged another 1 billion vaccine doses for the continent. But first, the South African government is ramping up pressure on other countries to lift travel restrictions that were quickly put in place following the discovery of the Omicron variant last week. Over the weekend, authorities called the restrictions a punishment for merely detecting the new variant. Meanwhile, British citizens in southern Africa will be able to return home beginning tomorrow when British Airways flights to the UK resume. However, South Africa is still on the UK's red list, which means that citizens will have to quarantine for 10 days. Nadine Theron has more from Cape Town. The reopening of direct flights between the UK and South Africa has given travellers some hope amidst worldwide travel bans on Southern African countries. President Cyril Ramaphosa last night called on all countries who have imposed travel bans on South Africa to urgently lift these before more damage is done to the economy. Ramaphosa says these travel bans are a direct departure from, from the G20 Rome declaration made last month when countries decided to reopen international travel to help developing countries like South Africa to recover from the pandemic. The president says these travel bans are scientifically unjustified and that South Africa is being unfairly discriminated against. At the moment, the country is losing 200 million rand per day while these bans are in place. In the meantime, only around 3,000 new cases of coronavirus have been detected in South Africa. But in the Gauteng province, where most of these cases are, COVID-19 hospitalizations have tripled in the past two weeks. It's surprising that Ramaphosa didn't tighten local coronavirus regulations and restrictions, but he said he might do so next week, and these will be reviewed next week. Local health authorities say that by the weekend, we could expect to see 10,000 new daily cases of the virus. It's a big day for LGBT residents in Botswana. The government has lost a legal attempt to overturn a ruling that decriminalized homosexuality. The high court ruling from 2019 made jail sentences for same-sex relationships unconstitutional. Prior to this, offenders could face up to seven years in prison. But the government sought to revoke the two-year-old ruling, saying courts did not have jurisdiction in the matter. In his final statement, Judge Ian Kirby said gay citizens had long lived, quote, in constant fear of discovery or arrest when expressing love for their partners. Here's the head of the LGBT organization of Botswana reacting to the news. Today's judgment is quite um, awe-inspiring indeed because it is going to change the lives of many people in our country. It is really an opportunity for the LGBTIQ community to claim their humanity and to change the status quo in our country. At least three people were killed and 18 wounded after a French military convoy ran into a violent protest in the town of Terra in Niger on Saturday. Speaking to France 24, a French military commander said the, said the attacks left his troops facing, quote, an unprecedented situation. But he also said the French army was not responsible for the deaths of the protesters. Laurent Bersacher has more. The French military convoy was about to depart for Gao, its final destination, when it was stopped by hundreds of protesters in Terra in western Niger. Chanting anti-French slogans, they attempted to set up roadblocks, repeatedly ignoring the warnings of security forces. Tensions soon escalated as protesters began throwing stones at the soldiers. Some even stormed the convoy, directly attacking the trucks. Security forces responded by firing warning shots and tear gas to disperse the crowds, but the army says it never directly aimed at protesters. 
This was a really unexpected situation. People talk of a protest, but for me, these were scenes of urban guerrilla warfare. No weapons were used against the crowds. At least three people were killed and dozens wounded in the clashes. And while the circumstances remain unclear, many residents directly blamed the French army, which they accused of using lethal force against protesters. We saw a plane fly over the village, and that's when the gunfire began. People say it was the French soldiers who started shooting. The latest incident comes as France faces mounting criticism over its military presence in the Sahel, especially in former colonies like Niger, Mali and Burkina Faso. At least 20 people are dead in, in an attack on a camp for displaced persons in the northeastern DRC. According to a local chief and a civil rights group, the attack was carried out by men belonging to the Kodako militia, which has killed hundreds of civilians in the Ituri province. According to the civil rights groups, excuse me, according to the civil rights group that reported the news, it's the third attack on camps for displaced persons in the space of a week. While the Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo has seen violence for many years and in an attempt to turn the tide, the Congolese government has agreed to a joint operation with Uganda's army. The operation will target the Islamic State group and their local ally, the Allied Democratic Forces, or ADF. France 24's Clément Bonreau has more from Kinshasa. This Monday, the Congolese government tried to reassure the public by saying there are no Ugandan troops in DR Congo. However, the government spokesman highlighted that the two armies, uh, Ugandan and Congolese, have been cooperating very closely in recent years, exchanging intelligence, and they're now considering joint military action against the ADF on both sides of the border, should that be deemed necessary by the two countries. We work regularly with the armies of neighboring countries. And if, in the context of this regular exchange of intelligence, there is a need to move up a notch in relation to this common threat, which is like a metastasizing cancer, we will of course do so. The possibility of joint military action between DR Congo and Uganda has sparked uh, fierce reactions in uh, Kinshasa and elsewhere in the country. The Nobel uh, Peace Prize, uh, Dr. Denis Mukwege, uh, calling this decision, I quote, unacceptable. Meanwhile, some politicians are also uh, worried. Uh, we spoke to uh, Juvenal Moulin an MP from North Kivu. We could limit ourselves only to an exchange of information, whether it is with Uganda or with Rwanda. We're all members of the International Conference on the Great Lakes region, and there are mechanisms in place to facilitate intelligence sharing. But let's not forget that Uganda attacked Congo during the Second Congo War. The International Court of Justice has condemned Uganda, but they have yet to pay reparations to the DRC. For the time being, no joint operations are planned by DR Congo and Uganda. Uh, the government uh, says that it will inform the public of any developments in due course. The Forum on China-Africa Cooperation has begun in Dakar this Monday amid rising concerns over vaccine inequality in the pandemic. To that end, the Chinese president has pledged another 1 billion doses for the continent. That's on top of the nearly 200 million doses that China has already supplied to the region. Catherine Viet takes a closer look at the ties between Beijing and Africa. China and Africa are once again holding a summit pledging mutual cooperation. It's the eighth such meeting, but this year for the first time the Chinese president has stayed home. Instead, his ministers are in charge. The official reason, President Xi Jinping doesn't want to travel during the pandemic. But unofficially, it reflects a cooling off between the partners. Over the past 20 years, China has expanded its role in Africa, now becoming its biggest trading partner, but only where it suits Beijing's interests. For example, in Nigeria, because it's a major oil producer, Kenya for infrastructure projects, and Zambia because of its copper. Trade has grown from less than $10 billion to around $200 billion with a record set in 2013 thanks to investment in its vast Belt and Road Initiative. Bridges, ports, highways and dams. Today, one in three construction sites on the continent are Chinese, 
but it's a presence that comes at a price, including accountability and financial dependence. China is Africa's main donor. Over the past 20 years, Beijing has lent African countries more than $172 billion. Sometimes the loans are repaid in natural resources such as oil or cobalt. Over time, this dependence has created mistrust towards Beijing. In 2018, China's presence in Zambia sparked demonstrations. Beijing's political agenda, too, has posed problems for some after several African countries aligned their position with that of China's at the UN. Still others point to corruption and labor laws. Amid the rising discontent, China's level of investment in Africa has plunged, along with its loan amounts. Officially, the pandemic is again being blamed, but China started to pull back in 2018, well before COVID-19 struck. Finally tonight, 30 white rhinos have gotten the ride of a lifetime on a Boeing 747 that flew them from South Africa to Rwanda. It's the largest transfer of the species to ever be carried out. The 3,400 kilometer long journey and relocation are part of a program to replenish the population of white rhinos who have been decimated by poaching since the 1970s. Upon arrival, the 30 rhinos weighing up to two tons each were placed in two grassy areas, each the size of a football stadium. They will soon be allowed to roam the massive Akagera National Park. White rhinos are being persecuted on the continent. Their numbers, they are not stable. They're on a knife edge. They could go either way. If something happened to Kenya or to South Africa on the scene of white rhinos, that is where the majority of white rhinos are. Then white rhinos are really on the brink of extinction. So it makes no better sense than to bring them into safe areas, areas we know where they would thrive. They like these open areas. They like grazing in the grass, um, whereas black rhinos are much more bush um, thicket lovers and more solitary. They are all in a group together. They're very social animals. Um, and unfortunately, what's one of the reasons they've been extensively poached? Because they're easier. They're in the open, they're, in, they're visible, and they're together. Well, we hope they enjoy their new home. That does it for Ion Africa. Live from Paris continues with Yenna Lee in just a moment. In 2014, Montenegro joined forces with China for a colossal project, the construction of the country's first highway. Bemex is a company which began to show basically during the night and now all of a sudden we have Bemex winning all those state, state tenders. Colossal debt, environmental pollution and opaque communication. They have no right to make any interview from media and newspapers. We do not have permission from the government of Montenegro. Will the country ever see the end of the tunnel? Watch Reporters, Scandal in Montenegro on France 24 and France24.com.